Our future is unfolding before our eyes, with each season bringing new evidence of climate change to command our attention. Devastating storms and floods have hit the USA, Latin America and Southern Asia. Europe now lives with melting glaciers, forest fires, droughts and fatal heat waves. And people living on the margins in the third world are being pushed to the edge of survival. The Amazon rainforest could start turning to a desert if the rain fails for a third year in a row. Disappearing Arctic ice and permafrost warn of worse to come, bringing the threat of rising sea levels. The world has not been as warm as it is now for a millennium or more. The three warmest years on record have all occurred since 1998, 19 of the warmest 20 since 1980. Over the next 30 years, global temperatures will rise by between two and four degrees, bringing as yet unimaginable devastation. Even if we stop producing carbon dioxide and methane today, we would still see the impacts over the next 30 years. In this program, we'll be showing you how we got to where we are now, the damage we've caused, what the next 30 years really holds for us, and whether it's too late to do anything about it. Climate change is with us. After years of analysis, scientists of the world are united on the effects that human activity is having on our atmosphere. We now have the evidence we thought we wouldn't get. Confirmation of 20th century global warming. And it seems it's even worse than we ever thought. Carbon dioxide, CO2. You can't see it, but we now have about 380 parts per million in our atmosphere compared with the 280 parts in which all life here evolved. We know this because air bubbles trapped in Arctic ice show that for at least 400,000 years, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere closely followed global temperatures, as seen in the ice cores and tree rings. So what has changed? We have. Everything we do comes with a carbon price tag attached, and we're spending like there's no tomorrow to give us the lifestyle we have today. Imagine a mountain one mile high and 12 miles in circumference. That's what the 27 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide would look like if it was solidified. And that's what we're pumping out into the atmosphere every year. And it's growing. So how do we get here? If we look back at average temperatures from 1800 to the present day, we can see the planet in balance with natural variations right up to a sudden steady climb around the turn of the century, the start of the Industrial Revolution. Overlay natural climate variations, and you can see that this curve remains fairly constant, with sun activity and volcanic explosions explaining natural variations, right up to the Industrial Revolution, where the two curves split off. However, if you add an additional curve, representing levels of greenhouse gases from burning fossil fuels, the link between global warming and greenhouse gases becomes glaringly obvious. Globally, last year was the warmest year of the instrumental record, and the last decade was the warmest decade of the warmest century, of the warmest millennium, perhaps for the past 100,000 years. So we're undergoing very rapid change indeed, and uh, we're entering territory where we may even be entering climates which existed before humanity was on the planet. So we do need to be concerned about the future and how we're going to cope with that. For the last 10 years, signs have been with us in the form of extreme weather, or what we now know to be the first stages of climate chaos. Throughout the world, what we probably will find is that extreme events will continue to get more frequent, that events which occurred perhaps in the past, uh, once every 10 or 15 years, uh, will now occur much more frequently, perhaps every two or three years. 
have about 10 years to, to reach a peak of, of global pollution in terms of climate changing emissions and to bring it down. And that's an enormous challenge when we are only beginning to put the brakes on in the rich north and as yet in the south they're still developing and still burning more and more fossil fuels. So how concerned should we be? Well, I think it's very clear, Duncan, that humanity is facing one of its greatest crises ever. There are those who say that it's already too late to prevent the worst consequences of global warming and climate change. But what is clear is that if we do want to solve the problem in any effective way, it will call for measures much more serious, much more draconian than perhaps any which have been contemplated so far. At the moment, we believe we're heading for a two to four degree rise in temperature by the middle of the century. If that happens, the indications are that this is a tipping point, a point of no return for many environmental systems. The problem with an unstable climate is that we may not be able to recover the ground once this shift has taken place. That's why the United Nations has deemed a two degree rise to be dangerous climate change. The same communities that were hit by the tsunami a couple of years ago who will be hit by the increased storm, storms and floods from climate change. It's the same communities who are hit by famine and drought in Africa who will be hit by that even more when the climate change exacerbates the weather patterns that cause those things in the first place. So it's the poorest who are hit first and yet they aren't the ones who are responsible for, for producing it. I think global warming is probably the most significant threat that this globe has ever faced. And I think the urgency of the threats are not sufficiently known to most people, and in fact particularly to politicians who have to make very hard decisions around the world if we are to avert a major catastrophe. We haven't got the luxury of buying time, of waiting, and that of course is difficult because that means we have to make hard choices. If we don't make those choices today, they will become incredibly difficult for the people who come after us to try and make. Nicholas Stern, a leading economist, brought out a report on the economics of climate change which began to focus on the really, really serious economic implications of climate change for the developed world. And he talked about depressions like post-war type depressions, 20% drop in GDP unless we do something about it. This message has not been fully brought out. The cost of this dampening of the world economy could hit within a decade, leaving us little choice but to act now to reduce emissions. Taking a tonne of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere anywhere in the world helps. It doesn't have to be in Ireland, it doesn't have to be in France, it doesn't have to be in China, it can be anywhere. Well, Irish greenhouse gas emissions are, are currently um, at 123% of what they were in 1990, the base year for Kyoto. We are allowed a very generous increase under the Kyoto Protocol and now Treaty of 13%. Um, we're well over that. We are the fifth most climate polluting country in the world per head of population. So we're much worse than the rest of Europe and we're up there with countries like the US and Australia. Partly it's to do with our boom and the fact that we have put, we've made no changes to our lifestyle as we've gone through that boom in order to reduce our emissions. The reality of it is we're talking about a 5% reduction now under Kyoto. What's needed by 2050 is a 90% reduction. We are one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We should be the ones at the forefront of addressing the issue domestically. It's not sufficient to say, let somebody else worry about it. We'll buy their allowances and use them here so we can keep on emitting. That simply is not acceptable for a first world, for a developed country. We have to start addressing this nationally. And in fact, the countries that address it nationally, are, who are first to do that, will be the winners in the end. So far, we've failed to meet the generous targets we were given from Europe. This represents a huge missed opportunity to finance change through a period of extended and unprecedented prosperity. The next targets for reducing emissions will be much tougher for us in comparison. There's no doubt in the scientific community about our urgent need to meet them, and our European partners will not tolerate further excuses. We really are not doing our bit at the moment. We haven't really taken the radical steps necessary to address this problem in a serious way. And the evidence of that, of course, is in the fact that our um, 
our distance to target, if you like, in terms of the Kyoto Treaty um, is so large at the moment. We have to reduce our, our emissions in Ireland, our pollution, by about two thirds between now and 2050 in order to do our fair share. Now, there's no last minute fix to that. I think the Irish pride ourselves on being able to come up with some solution at the very last moment. You can't do that with climate change. The best way to do it is to start now, to do it in a planned way, and therefore we can really absorb the changes as we go along and, and not have our lifestyles overthrown thrown as they might be by disasters down the line. Of all the indicators we have of global warming, one of the clearest signs is the melting of our ice caps. Mark Cornelson has first-hand evidence from his work in the polar regions. The European Space Agency is using uh, two sorts of satellites with a radar to observe what's happening to the Arctic Ocean. And the observation is now so precise that they can see the difference between melting water on the ice and open water. So they can pinpoint the quality of ice. And in August of this year, they have seen a, a total breakup of the Arctic Ocean, like someone has been smashing the Arctic Ocean with a sledgehammer. What you see right now in the last year is that a lot of that ice is flushing out of the Arctic Ocean because it's too weak. It's not resisting the wind forces and the currents in the sea. The Arctic ice cap acts as a mirror reflecting radiation back into space. As it shrinks, more heat is able to enter and warm the surrounding ocean. This in return speeds up the melting of the ice, creating what is known as a feedback loop. If that ocean is exposed constantly to solar radiation, it will heat up tremendously and that will change circulation patterns in the ocean, that will change the wind directions. That is a huge impact. These systems respond very slowly because a lot of the effects are delayed effects. Like the emission of greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, is uh, up in the atmosphere for decades before it washes out. And, uh, and that's going to be a challenge. To play our part in tackling climate change here in Ireland, we're going to have to re-examine key aspects of our lifestyle that are not sustainable. We'll have to look towards what may seem to be quite radical solutions. And once we've accepted that changes must be made, we'll have to put them in place before it's too late. Climate change is, is um, a, a big problem that every sector across the economy is involved in. So in planning for the development of every single sector, we need to factor in the plans to bring down those greenhouse gases, or at least to stabilise them. Well, if you look at uh, car use, uh, which is increasing, uh, car ownership is certainly increasing in Ireland, what we have to say is, can we get people out of their cars? In other words, get people onto public transport. And we need to do that quicker than we're doing it, and we need to do that more efficiently than we're doing it. The spatial strategy, the national spatial strategy, has to be adhered to, where we put people and jobs side by side so they aren't commuting for two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, and, and generating a whole lot of greenhouse gases. I think we need to look at the congestion charge, perhaps having one at least to begin with for Dublin, copying the successful example in London. There's a, 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 something that's been talked about for a long time that we need to do is to begin to tax our cars according to how much they pollute, not according to how big the engine is. And I think ultimately we will have to start taxing people for carbon emissions. We've avoided doing that in the past. Uh, I think uh, it will come back as a necessity in the years ahead. In order to reach the targets of stopping dangerous levels of climate change, we need to recognise how crucial this new thinking is for transport strategy. Tackling urban sprawl and car use is no longer a lifestyle issue for a country obsessed by journey times and congestion. We now know it's linked to our future survival. We have a poor uptake of a public transport system that has not kept pace with their changing needs. We revel in cheap air flights and carry food and goods over massive distances. If we had any doubt over our continuing fossil fuel addiction, it's laid to rest by the fact that at a time when we should be reducing carbon dioxide emissions in transport, we're currently increasing them by an alarming 6% per year. Our farming sector is not surprisingly one of our biggest contributors to greenhouse gases. With nearly 14 million cows and sheep in the country, it's one of the areas we'll have to look at if we're going to meet the target set for us. Well, 
agriculture forms an important part of the uh, nation's CO2 emissions. Um, not just CO2, but of course methane, which is the, the prime uh, greenhouse gas from agriculture. There is potential for farmers, and in fact, I think farmers have to be involved in the solution to our problems here, because farmers now get paid from Brussels whether they produce food or not. The land is available to produce energy crops, and the energy crops could be miscanthus, could be rapeseed oil, but could also be grass. That material could be used in our, to generate power. We can support our farmers as well while cutting back on, on emissions. Some of the biggest emissions that, that, that are associated with food production are in the transport of food. It's in having apples from New Zealand and uh, mange two peas from Zambia that we actually encourage, uh, encourage pollution. The more we use local food and the more we support Irish farmers, the lower the pollution. However, the climate um, may also change for farmers in terms of their ability to produce food. And from the um, models we've been running, um, it would appear that uh, certain crops, which are, are quite common at the moment, will be rather more difficult to grow in the years ahead in Ireland. We expect, for example, potatoes uh, to be um, very, very much more difficult to grow because of summer drought. We expect maize to begin to take over from wheat and barley. We expect soya bean to become a crop which will be more widely grown at the end of the present century. Agriculture and rural development in the third world will bear the brunt of climate change, especially in areas limited in water infrastructure. With our subsidies coming to an end, we have the opportunity to manage change at a time when we've to rethink agricultural policies anyway. Locally growing and supplying foods and changing our farmers into energy producers is just common sense, given the changing landscape of our farming. However, this process cannot happen by itself. It needs funding and incentives to get it up and running. So what about industry? Are industry playing their part in this whole area? Well, by and large, Irish industry is fairly new and it's reasonably energy efficient, actually, when you compare it to other countries. Uh, what we've done in, in, in all of the European Union is we've introduced this emissions trading scheme for the big emitters, the big industrial emitters, like the power stations that we have close to us here and cement works and so on. And that, that works on the basis that people can trade, they can buy what they need effectively uh, on a global market. And since it's a global problem, then anywhere you reduce the emissions is fine. It, it, it's, it's contributing. The difficulty though is that because we are so wealthy now that Ireland is tending to buy its way out of the problem, either, both at industrial level and indeed nationally. And that is not sufficient. The cost of not tackling climate change is actually much greater than the cost of tackling it. Our European partners have signalled that our buying 22 million tonnes of carbon credits is unacceptable and we'll have to try much harder to shoulder our share of the burden in the future. We have to set clear targets for our industry, aiming to reduce emissions by at least 5% per year over a 10-year period. Embracing renewable fuels will make our industries more competitive and less dependent on global fuel supply. The big thing in power generation that others don't talk about is how wasteful the way we, we produce and transmit electricity is. About two thirds of the, the energy that goes into electricity is lost because we generate it in one place and transport it across the high voltage wires to our homes. We need to actually decentralise our electricity production. We can, for example, exploit wind, we can exploit uh, wave, we can exploit tides, we can exploit biofuels much more effectively than we are at the moment. And uh, they will help. They may not be a complete solution, but they will help diminish the growth in our emissions from power generation. Wasting 70% of the power we generate is clearly unacceptable, and making our electricity supply efficient is now an urgent priority. Renewable energy sources are now recognised to be the way forward for power generation, but require more support and investment than we're currently giving them. Closing our old dirty power stations and moving to locally generated combined heat and power is essential if we're to shift efficiency from the woeful 30 to the 80% target we need to reach. A 
our energy usage is, is very high uh, and our, um, our lack of proper insulation in our, in our housing stock and in our office stock and our buildings generally uh, is lower than it should be, uh, much lower than it should be. So we're effectively heating our gardens and, and, and the areas around our houses rather than heating the inside of our houses. We've got used to heating our homes to a degree that we never did before uh, and people have, uh, are, are uh, utilising that extra heat um, by, by uh, dressing differently. At the moment um, we, we, we build uh, structures, uh, buildings which uh, are not as efficient as they might be in terms of conserving energy and um, that is the most cost efficient way of reducing carbon dioxide emissions at the moment. It's in insulation standards and building conservation in terms of, of energy efficiency. We're building our homes for a world that no longer exists. Our building standards are inadequate for the era we're now entering. New standards of insulation and a vast programme of upgrading private and public building stock is now needed. The era of climate change coincides with fuel scarcity and rising prices will leave the poorest in the country literally out in the cold. just on the brink of having a new national development plan which will be a plan, a blueprint for the country from 2007 to 2013 and that plan needs to take uh, environment into account from the beginning so that uh, when you're planning for transport you're taking environment into account at the beginning when you're planning for agriculture you're taking environment into account in the plan in designing the plan and that's the only way by integrating as we say integrating environment into other sectors that's the only way we're going to take environment seriously enough There's huge scope for energy savings in, in our homes and our offices. Uh, the European Union has estimated that we could save 20% of our energy by just uh, using our energy more efficiently at home. When, when nobody thought about energy prices, we, we all happily left our lights on, we didn't insulate our buildings properly. The rising prices may make us think more about that. On the domestic front, there are loads of small things that people can do. They can turn down the thermostats, they can turn off equipment that's on standby, they can insulate their houses better, they can use, they may maybe walk to the shops rather than drive to the car, maybe let their children cycle to school rather than carrying them in the car. While these are all individually very small things, when you add them all up together, if everybody does this, then they can really make a difference and they can reduce the overall emissions. What we need is an, a framework from government, leadership from, from our politicians, and then we need to take responsibility as individuals to take all the small steps in our life that will, that will uh, make a big difference in the long run. I think people are still at the stage of thinking that the government can solve this, that it's not a personal responsibility issue. But I'm afraid it is up to each one of us in our personal lifestyles to change the things that we're doing, whether it's at work or whether it's at play or whether it's at home. Um, there is a personal responsibility on people and I don't think that message has got across. Climate change will demand that we rethink not just travel habits and loft insulation, but the whole scope of our economy and society. This process will involve forward planning on a national and international scale that we've never done before. I really think that uh, Irish people haven't really begun to address the urgency of climate, global climate change at all. This is a massive global threat to humanity. And we, as one of the wealthiest countries in the world, people who have benefited from the use of fossil fuels for hundreds of years, have to be in the vanguard of addressing it. We can't be leaving it to the poorer countries, the countries who emit a fraction of the greenhouse gases that we do per head, to let them do it. There is nobody else to do this. We can't say let somebody else do it. There is nobody else to do it. We have to do it. The first world has to do it. Based on our current performance, the question we'll find hardest to answer will be, why didn't we do more when we had the chance?